Okay, welcome back to the second part of the lecture where we will discuss the so-called random effects approach. So previously we focused pretty much uh, only on the fixed effects approach where we allow for arbitrary correlation between the observed X variables and the unobserved alpha. Yeah? So if you go back to the assumptions that we make, we make no assumptions on the correlation between X and alpha, which is why the fixed, uh, fixed effects approach is considered to be robust against correlation between observed co uh, covariates and unobserved characteristics. And yeah, so this is the big advantage of fixed effects um, approaches and uh, is probably also the reason why in practice, if you look at empirical papers, fixed effects is used far more often as compared to random effects. And nevertheless, random effects can be interesting and it's always useful to know what is happening in random effects. Now, we've seen, for instance, that uh, when you have fixed effects, you cannot identify time invariant observed characteristics. Yeah? So when we have a gender dummy that typically doesn't change over time and therefore it cannot be identified uh, because these data transformations, like for instance, first differencing, wipe out any data, uh, sorry, time invariant characteristics. We also saw that we can still, you know, identify changes across time However, uh, there is also a downside to this, um, namely many times, let's say for instance, the, win, uh, the gender pay gap, it may not change a lot across time. Yeah? So therefore, when you take differences, the gender pay gap change is not wiped out because it's not exactly time invariant. However, it is pretty close to being time invariant. Yeah? Let's just imagine this situation. Therefore, if you take the difference, you get something that is pretty close to zero. And uh, that can give you trouble because, well, once you compute your estimator, you have to invert a matrix. And let's assume you only have one, uh, you only have like this, the gender pay gap uh, variable in your model. That means you will divide by something that is close to zero and this will blow off your standard errors. Yeah, so uh, again, nothing comes for free. This also comes at the cost of potentially large standard errors. So sometimes maybe you don't have even you don't even have a choice. You have to rely on the so-called random effects, name, which means that you have to make a couple of pretty strong assumptions. And the, because these assumptions are so strong, when you send your paper to uh, Econometrica, the referee will tell you no. <laughs> so. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is the way it is nowadays, unless you have a very good reason to use random effects and a very good argument why these assumptions should hold. Okay, um, now let's talk about the assumptions. So on top of strict exogeneity, like our usual assumption that we also use in the fixed effects approach, which itself is also pretty strong already. Yeah? Now we also make this assumption here. Yeah? So we say that uh, alpha is mean independent from the whole time series of the axis. Yeah? And we also say that the mean of alpha itself is zero. Now, why is this such a strong assumption? Well, I mean, it implies that uh, the alpha is completely uncorrelated with the explanatory variables across all time periods. Yeah? And this kind of goes against like the reason why we introduced these unobserved variables in the first place, right? So if you remember from the discussion at the very beginning, when we introduced these alphas, we wanted to account for individual ability, individual motivation, genetics, whatever, you name it. And of course, uh, these things may be correlated with observed characteristics in your typical application. Yeah, so therefore, if you want to use a random effects approach, you better have a good argument on why this uncorrelatedness assumption should hold. Yeah, so uh, by the way, first remark, this is what I call like the random effects assumption one. Now in other books, it's simply this uncorrelatedness that is called uh, the random effects assumption. Yeah? So this can be, uh, yeah, this changes wherever you kind of look at. Um, this is pretty much enough to uh, get something consistent. Yeah? So, but uh, this is nicer because we have something causal. Yeah? We discussed this in the last tutorial, the difference between strict exogen uh, exogeneity and orthogonality. Um, okay, so 
if you combine strict exogeneity with this new assumption here, then it turns out that this model error here, VIT, is uh, mean independent of all the x's. And here, VIT again has this uh, like error components model. Yeah? So it has an idiosyncratic model error, and there is an individual specific uh, part of the model error. OK, now what do we do with this? Well, I mean, first of all, if you make this assumption, well, simply running the pooled OLS estimator is give you is going to give you a consistent estimator. Now, the next question is, of course, you made all this 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 fancy assumption. Do you win anything by this assumption besides consistency, uh, which is pretty obvious? Obvious if you kind of assume away the problem. Um, now, one consequence of having the alpha i in the model error. Um, is that even if like the UIT here, the idiosyncratic error is completely serially uncorrelated. So over time, there is no correlation in U. Um, because the alpha is there and that doesn't change across time, there will be serial correlation in the Vs. Yeah? So, and um, well, this actually you can exploit uh, in the random effects. So uh, if, you com if you take the covariance between um, two model errors from different time periods, well, if the UITs are serially uncorrelated, that part will be zero in this correlation here, in this covariance, and only the alpha i that is common to both terms, this will give you um, the covariance between these two uh, errors. Yeah, and of course, uh, this is something positive, typically, if alpha is truly a random variable. Um, therefore, you can exploit this information that you have. Yeah? So you have assumed that there is some alpha in the model error, and now you go and you exploit it by, uh, well, using this structure in the VCV and the variance covariance matrix. OK, now, in order to do that optimally, we introduce further assumption. Yeah? So now we're in the mood of making assumptions. And therefore, why not also add homoscedasticity? Again, in practice, homoscedasticity is often not credible. Yeah? So again, remember, what does homoscedasticity mean? It means that the spread in the model error does not change um, depending on the value of x. And uh, just to remind you, when would that be, for instance, not credible? It is um, when you, for instance, look at the effect of education on your wages, then you will see that the spread for low levels of education is relatively little. Yeah? So people tend to make relatively the same money. But once you go kind of uh, after university, then there will be some people that become managers of uh, big companies, make a lot of money. Um, some people you know, study philosophy and maybe make not so much money. And uh, so, so far the cliche. Um, Anyway, so let's assume homoscedasticity anyway, even though it may not be necessarily credible always. Um, so we do this for the uh, idiosyncratic error, and we do this for the alpha itself. Yeah, so alpha is really has nothing to do with the x's here. Neither the first moment, the expectation of alpha, nor kind of the second. Yeah, so when we take the square, nothing has anything to do with x. OK, now um, with this assumption, we can see that like if we take, uh, this should be, uh, sorry, a square here, like the square of UIT, again, something that I should have to fix. And um, the U's are serially uncorrelated. OK, so moreover, you can see that if you take the condition expectation of this product of these uh, two composite error terms here, um, it coincides actually with the unconditioned expectation because, well, on the right hand side, you see here you take a conditioned expectation, but on the right hand side, there is no x. And similarly, for the alpha, you take a conditioned expectation, but on the right hand side, there is no x, which means that these conditioned expectations coincide with unconditional expectations. Yeah, so this is pretty much what is said here. And now let's look at the uh, covariance matrix that I call omega here. Yeah, so it's simply this vector vi, that's a t vector, uh, times this, uh, no, the prime. This gives a t by t matrix. 
And what we see is that on the diagonal, we have both kind of the variance of the alpha and the variance on the, of the U. And on the off diagonal, we only have the variance of the alphas because the U's, remember, are serially uncorrelated. Yeah? So here, for instance, the expectation of U1 times U2 would be zero. And therefore, it's only the alpha part that stays. Okay, so now omega has some nice properties. So uh, omega is Hermitian, um, which means that it coincides with its conjugate transpose. In our case, it's simply the transpose because we have uh, it's only real valued numbers here. And it's positive definite because we know, well, it is kind of a covariance matrix and thus it should be invertible. And well, because omega has these properties, we can find from the so-called Koleski decomposition a matrix that I call here omega to the power uh, minus one half. Yeah, so we can simply decompose the inverse of omega into the product of two matrices. Yeah? And this uh, one of these um, in the product is what I call here omega to the power minus one half. So it's a di direct. Um, it comes directly from the so-called Koleski decomposition. Okay, so um, let's rewrite the model. Yeah, so in the stacked version, and um, let's multiply this omega to the power minus one half from the left to both sides. Yeah, so then we get this uh, tilde notation here, and uh, well, this omega is kind of a matrix here that is full of constants, right? So it should not affect the uh, exogeneity of the observed covariates. Yeah, so what you can then show is that even this transformed X that has been pre-multiplied with omega to the power minus one half, this will still be uncorrelated with the transformed model errors. Okay, so now let's simply kind of, this is, uh, what we just discussed. And now let's go back to the original um, um, notation. Because we take here the uh, the prime, the transpose of x tilde, that means, uh, you know, we have xi times um, omega comes to the other side. Yeah? And therefore, we have here the product of two omegas to the power of minus one half. And uh, in the next step, we take our vi and simply use our original model yeah, in order to replace the unobserved model error by observable quantities. Yeah? So yi minus xi beta. So this is pretty standard. This is what we always do. And so we found our gi of beta, which we need for GMM. So this is our moment function. OK, now. If you look at this and you consider to estimate this with GMM, of course, you need to make an additional assumption, namely a full rank assumption. Yeah? So this is RE3. We have to assume that this thing here has full rank. OK, so um, now finally, we see that what is the dimension of our moment function? Well, it happens to have the same dimension as our vector of parameters that we want to estimate. So it's the same dimension as the dimension of xit. And thus, beta is exactly or just identified. And if you recall from GMM, in that case, it simply coincides with pooled OLS. Yeah? So like it's very easy to find the random effects estimator. We simply... Um, set this thing here to zero and we replace this expectation here by the sample average. Yeah, this is, if you remember the analogy principle, we replace population um, population means by sample means. Yeah, that's the analogy principle. Okay, so, and uh, well, we simply solve this equation and this is what we get. Okay, now this is actually, a regular generalized least squares estimator, which happens to be a little bit more efficient than uh, the pooled OLS estimator. So it can be shown that this thing will have a lower variance than simply using pooled OLS, simply because you exploit the structure in the covariance matrix omega. However, now this still has a big problem. Omega 
is not observed in that, right? We don't know what uh, these things here are. We actually don't know the variance of alpha. We don't, we don't know the variance of u. Therefore, the estimator in its current form is called infeasible. We cannot, well, it's gently not available because we don't see omega. Okay, now, of course, whenever there is something that we don't see, our strategy is put ahead on it. Yeah? So meaning we estimate it. Okay, so we need estimators like uh, sigma hat of alpha squared and sigma hat u squared. And in order to do so, we can pretty much follow a similar idea than in GMM. So we have an initial estimator. We only need a consistent estimator and we know that uh, that what we remarked here, right? Pooled OLS in the original model is already consistent. Okay, so let's use that idea. Let's derive an initial estimator beta tilde simply by using pooled OLS in the original model. And uh, once you have this beta tilde, we do the following. Well, first of all, we use the residuals from the original model using this beta tilde. And using those, you then find, well, you basically simply square each of the residuals and take the sample average of all. And by the law of large numbers, this will converge to what you want, you know, the sigma squared uh, of V. Um, finally, you also need an estimator for, not finally yet actually, finally comes in the next step. So here we, we derive an estimator for the sigma alpha squared, which was the expectation of the product of two of these Vs when the time periods do not match. Yeah. Um, okay, so how do we do that? Well, if you look at this here, has some similarity, well, the sum over i doesn't change. But the trick here is to only use the product of residuals where the t is not the same as s. And how do we do that? Well, in the first sum, you see that t starts from 1 and goes to t minus 1. Uh, why only to t minus 1? Well, we see that here in the second sum, um, when t is 1, then s starts at 2 and goes to t. Now, when t is 2, then s starts at 3 and goes up to t. And therefore, of course, if t was equal to uh, capital T, then this sum would be empty. Yeah? There would be an empty sum, it drops out anyway. So therefore, this goes only to t minus 1. OK, so uh, again, this will be a consistent estimator for sigma alpha squared. Uh, and by the way, so here you see that these are exactly the number of summons in this sum here. Uh, that can be, well, it's not that difficult to show. Um, okay, now we have this estimator yeah, for sigma v squared and we have an estimator for sigma alpha squared. Uh, therefore, we can estimate sigma u squared by, okay, here, of course, there's another square missing. I will fix that. Um, by simply combining these two estimates, yeah, because, well, like the difference is a continuous um, transformation and therefore by the continuous mapping theorem, if those two things here are consistent, the left-hand side thing will also be consistent. Um, okay, now you have estimators for um, sigma u squared and for sigma alpha squared. Now what you do is you go back to your omega here and you plug all these estimators here wherever you see kind of the sigmas. Thus you get an omega hat and that omega hat you plug in here instead of omega and there you go. This is your random effects estimator. Um, yeah, okay, that's it. Yeah, so this was pretty much everything on random effects. As I said, nowadays, um, fixed effects is by far dominant. Yeah, so it's by far much, much, much more used than the random effects approach. There's also in between things um, for which I don't think we will have the time. So for instance, there's something that is called the correlated random effects approach that is trying to kind of at least allow for correlation um, between the means of the axis and the unobserved uh, alpha. Yeah? So this is like something in between the two extremes.
Okay, so um, this is the part about random effects. In the next part, we talk about standard errors again in the fixed effects models.